Okay. So essentially all the packages I'm loading in here are the same as previously with the exception of the move package. So this move package is what I'm using to run the, the dynamic Brownian bridge movement model, but everything else is essentially the same for data wrangling, for mapping, um, color palettes, timing, model runs, things like that. Um, all that essentially stays the same. So I'll load these in. Okay, and then again, we're gonna read in our data that was exported from the state space model. So we have five different tagged individuals and we're gonna start off again by converting date to a date time format. Um, but one thing we wanna do here, since this model is accounting for the location error is to basically have a single column that provides that error because it doesn't take the error in the X and the Y direction. It only takes a single value that's used across all directions from that point. Um, so in this case, we're saying that we want the, the value that has the smallest error depending on whether it's X or Y. And we're calling that uh, capital SE that's our column name for it. And let's take a quick look at the distribution of what those standard error sizes actually are. And these are gonna be in kilometers. So looking at this histogram, it looks like the vast majority of these standard errors for the location are less than one kilometer. So that's pretty good. And I think, yeah, 97% of the time it seems that these observations are less than one kilometer. Uh, so for moving forward, I think in general, unlike for kernel density estimation, it's best to estimate the dynamic Brownian bridge model um, separately by ID, because otherwise it tries to estimate a raster surface across the full extent of your tracks. So if you have a bunch of individuals that are within a relatively um, constrained focal area, then you can probably do that. But if you have these migratory individuals that are covering this broad, vast area, and you want um, these raster layers that have a fine spatial resolution, um, it's just not gonna work that well. And it's gonna take forever to estimate. Um, so I recommend here in this case, like we did with some of the kernel density estimations at the ends um, from the last section, to just run these separately by individual. Um, so for reading this in for the model, we need to uh, make it in a format that the, the package can look at and process. Um, so there are some, some objects I'm going to create that I'm gonna run through a for loop here to store our results. So I'm creating an empty object called dat list. It's gonna be a list of length dat two. So that's the number of individuals this is going to store the results from the model. And we have a separate object called contours. And this is going to store the resulting 50% and 95% UD isoplots or contours from that uh, fitted model. So I'm going to create these. And again, these are just empty lists that I'm going to store my data. And then here I have this for loop that I will briefly discuss. So I'm estimating this dynamic Brownian bridge movement model separately per individual. So I'm saying for i, for variable i from one to the length of this list. So that's gonna be five. I'm gonna start off by just printing the ID number or name, just so I know where the, this for loop is at while it's running. And I'm going to use this move function to essentially get it in a format that this package can read properly. So providing things such as the X coordinate, the Y coordinate, which are here, the world Mercator projection um, in kilometers, the time or the date time here. Then I provide the actual whole data frame as well as the projection and then the ID for this animal arguments. And then beneath that, um, I'm defining the extent of the bounding box um, for some of these individuals especially those that aren't migrating. And that makes this estimation process a bit easier. 
and then once that is done, once I'm defining this raster extent, um, I actually run the Brownian bridge, dynamic Brownian bridge movement model and specify some different variables here. So I'm timing it using the TikTok package. Um, I feed it in this, this move package object, dat.move that I just created here above. I'm setting the raster spatial resolution to 0 0.25 or 250 meters because units are in kilometers. The location error is using this SE column from the data sets. And then finally, I'm estimating or defining the margin and the window size. Um, so here I'm using a margin of nine and a window size of 29. So margin of nine means that the beginning of this window is going to remove essentially nine observations from consideration. And at the end of the window, it's going to remove another nine. So really, this is removing 18 points and only leaving 11 um, for consideration to estimate a break point. And then here, the uh, X arguments is um, I'm providing the raster extent that I want this to consider to make these estimates. And then towards the bottom here, I'm using this raster to contour function to essentially uh, convert this from a raster to a set of contours at these levels. So the 50% and 95% isopleths resulting from the dynamic Browning bridge model, and then converting this to an SF object and the contours list. And then a lot of times these are created as um, line strings, which I don't necessarily want. Um, so if it's gonna give me a line string class, I'm gonna convert it to a polygon. And that is the entire for loop. So there's a lot going on here. Um, I just wanted to walk through it, especially since we have the time to do so. So now if I run this, we'll see printed out in the console, the ID, and then the size of the raster, essentially it's fitting and the amount of time it's taking to run. And given that our data set isn't super large because we are making predictions at an eight hour time interval instead of the original like one hour time interval. Um, this is going pretty quickly. And you'll see these warnings pop up. This isn't really an issue. Um, this again is just remnants from this ongoing transition that's happening where um, the move package is, has dependencies for the SP and raster packages, which I mentioned yesterday are essentially gonna be deprecated. So hopefully if they want this package to continue being used, they'll start converting their functions over to start using other packages such as SF and Terra or stars instead. Um, but for now, it's still dependent on um, the SP and raster packages. So you might see errors like this. The results here are still valid. Um, so to start off, to get some initial plots, one way we can look at the results is to get the volume of these utilization distributions. So essentially the probability density across these estimated surfaces. So um, again, this is like showing the, the raster before from the kernel density estimate. I'm only gonna do this for one individual just to show an example of it, um, but I'm not gonna use it that much afterwards. So I'm gonna create one for the 95% contour or isopleth and then one for the 50%. And then everything else that's outside of that, um, I'm going to label NA so it essentially doesn't give it a color value. All right, so for this one individual, here is the 95% UD. So it was um, tagged here, Fernando de Neronia, at this kind of small constrained spot. And then this is the one that moved south down along the coastline. And then for the 50% contour, we can basically not really see much of anything. That's because it's so small. Um, so in this case, apart from zooming in, it's really hard to see what's happening. Um, so I'm not really going to work through using this type of uh, visualization approach moving um, beyond this. But we are going to start using these, these contours we extracted from the model results. So I'm going to give it some names. Let's maybe look at the uh, estimated areas across individuals. So if I scroll up my console, 
Um, we see two numbers. So the smaller one is the 50% isopleather contour, and the larger one is the 95%. Um, so this is one way you can essentially calculate your areas for these different contours and do it per individual, potentially for later comparison. Um, okay, now I'm going to add a column for the ID to these contours. And that way we can label these when we plot them or map them. And now let's visualize the results. So bring in that Brazil vector layer. All right, so showing both the 50% and 95% separately. Um, this is for all individuals mapped together. We see that the 50% uh, contours seem to be only found at the island, whereas uh, the 95% contours are at the island, but then also near the foraging grounds. And for some of these migrating individuals, um, at different steps along this migratory path. Um, so in these cases, that might not be particularly useful. because obviously they're not really using these areas. Um, they're probably using the areas next to these foraging grounds next to the mainland um, more intensely than this actual path in the middle of the ocean. And if we plot this separately per individual, it might make it a little bit easier to see some of these patterns um, per track. But for these migrating individuals, so like the first individual, we only see the 95% contours at the starting and ending locations. There's nothing really in between during that migration phase. However, for the second individual, we are capturing these points along that migratory route. So this may involve needing to adjust um, the sliding window size and margin size to potentially remove that from consideration. But for this last migrating individual, it does appear to do a pretty good job, although it also identifies some of these locations along the migration path. And then obviously for the two resident individuals, both contours are at the island. Um, so if we focus on some of these individuals, uh, one at a time, so these plots appear a bit larger. And we include the tracks as well. We can see how well it's hugging these paths during this estimation process. I think this is particularly going to be um, useful to actually zoom in on these resident individuals. So one of our resident individuals we see these kind of spiking forays away from the islands, or at least away from this constrained region that it's staying at. And those are outside of even the 95% contour. And then we have our core area, our 50% contour, where it's spending most of its time. But this is a very small region in general, um, since this animal is not leaving the island and staying put essentially on one part of it. Same goes for this other individual that was residents. Um, very constrained in its space use with some brief forays that are likely due to location error from Argos, um, but otherwise not really moving around too much. Um, but to show another migratory individual, this last one, we see this large migratory phase where there's maybe a couple spots towards the end of that migration period that are part of that 95% contour. But otherwise, we have some broadening or widening of that, that contour once it hits the mainland and goes south. And then that narrows a bit as it picks up speed. And then as it slows down again, it expands once it reaches the foraging area. OK, so if you plot everything together all at once um, per individual, we have the tracks color coded per ID. And then in black is the, the contours where the top plot is the 50% contour to the core areas. And then the bottom is the 95%. Um, so for the 50%, there's only these contours at the islands. And then a couple um, as these, these tracks are moving south along the mainland, but the 95% contours are spread out a bit more. And that is it for 
the dynamic running bridge movement model for fitting that to these tracks. Um, do we have any questions related to this fitting process? Obviously, you could go through different iterations of trying different margin and window sizes, which might be a good idea. Um, but that's not something I'm going to be doing during this, this workshop. <clears throat> 